on behalf of Dean and Jubaili, I just want to say thank you very much for the great response we've gotten in terms of people registering. It's a, it's a very big audience and we appreciate that um, a lot. So thank you for that, firstly, and um, thank you for taking the time to listen to us on what we believe is a very important topic. And uh, yeah, so as William mentioned, uh, all questions can be um, typed in the chat. And um, what we, if we have time left, at the end we will attend to, to most of them, but the rest we will address and get back to every one of you by email. Okay, so um, then let's then just get started with the presentation. I'm going to turn off my camera just to avoid any distractions. Um, again, if there's any problems, if you can't see my points or anything, just uh, type in the chat for us. Okay, thanks. Okay, so first of all, a very popular topic currently in the industry is um, photovoltaic and PV systems. This is an incredibly fast growing market. And it's a very unique market in terms of lighting protection. There are standards specifically written for this market segment and a range of products developed by a lot of different manufacturers only specifically for photovoltaic or PV systems. So um, with the grow in market, we currently see these plants being deployed, obviously, in very large um, open areas where the lighting risk is very high. Okay, so um, it's obviously very important to ensure that you have very adequate protection um, for these uh, sp specific PV systems. Okay, so just before I start with that presentation of, um, of PV specifically, I just want to give you some background regarding DEN as well and where we do come from. So, first of all, DEN is um, a German headquarters company um, with a market presence in more than 70 countries worldwide. So, I see a lot of people registered from all over the world. I firmly believe that you will be able to be assisted in all the different countries that you are uh, all over the world. The company is a fourth generation owned family company um, from the from the Dane family. So just a brief background regarding the timeline of Dane as well. So Dane uh, was actually the company Dane was founded in 1910 by the father of lighting protection, Hans Dane. Okay, so um, it's believed that he actually developed lighting protection and the whole field of lighting protection at that time. If you fast forward a couple of years, you can see a uh, various patents registered, world first products developed. Some of them you may see as um, in 1954, the first, the world's first surge arrestor. And fast forward a couple of years, the world's first um, separable earth rod. And the, the list of patents continues. So it's something that we are very proud of um, and something that we believe we strive to become um, and stay one of the, the market leaders in the industry. Okay, so then to start with a presentation specifically for PV, I think it's good to kick things off always to look at examples of um, damage to PV systems and why lighting protection is specifically relevant um, to this field. To understand that, we need to understand and how, how we quantify lighting and the field of lighting protection. Okay, so to give you some oh, a brief background, you can see a chart of the world's lightning activity. This is called the ground flash density map, and lightning is measured in a, a ground flash density value. Okay, this value is defined as the number of direct lightning strikes to ground per square kilometer per year. The image that you see in front of you is um, reference from the NASA optical transient dispersion. Um, of a mixture of satellite and ground sensors. You can see obviously that um, in the heart of Africa, lightning is the most uh, common or the most dangerous, I would say. And it, you can see also that lightning is actually quite present on um, the, the equator. You'll see that also there's um, in the water sections around some of the continents, there's not a lot of lightning shown. Doesn't mean that there's no lightning. There's obviously just no ground sensors to verify the data. Okay, so obviously it's a very big market in sub-Saharan Africa, Americas, and definitely Southeast Asia as well. Um, and this is some of the places where we see most of the, the uh, new PV plants coming up to be installed, some of the biggest ones in the world, in fact, as well. 
Okay, why this is also very relevant, um, if you look at this image, this is referenced from a uh, German insurance company of claims that were paid out for photovoltaic systems in 2017. And you can see on the big red portion that more than 42%, which is a massive number, was paid out to lightning and surge protection damage on the PV plants. Okay, so obviously this is a very relevant topic and something that needs to be considered every single time you develop and build a new PV plant. Okay, so next, some of the damages. You can see that um, this is an example of a lightning strike to a PV panel, a PV module inside the field. What happens here is obviously the panel gets damaged, but there's no way to control um, the conduction of the lightning current to earth if you don't have a dedicated lightning protection system. This means that lightning can flash to surrounding panels and cables hanging underneath the panels, which goes to the electrical equipment and so on. So the damage is not limited to this panel specifically. Okay. Next is also lightning current that entered an, an, an inverter. You can see the, the burnt damage um, on the PCBs. And next you can see another example of an inverter where there was a lightning strike which caused arcing. DC arcing and the DC arcing started a fire and um, it burned down most of the electrical installation. This is an example of a PV plant that we have in South Africa. There was a study that was done um, with DEN. So in this case, a lightning actually struck um, some of the air termination rods and even into the soil and the ground potential rise and the voltage inside the soil due to this lightning strike actually flashed through the the insulation of the cables. And this then also entered the PV system. Now this is something that's very difficult to pick up, of course, obviously, because most of those cables are on the ground and it, there's no way to actually um, pick up on these small um, insulation breakdowns. Okay, so we've seen some examples now of, of damage. Um, but now we're going to dig into um, what actually causes this damage and how act lightning actually um, strikes any of these PV plants and, and how lightning is characterized and how we actually um, design systems to mitigate the risks. So first of all, and this is very important, is that lightning is, um, is present up to two kilometers away. This is referenced from the standard due to the massive network of cables um, in our grids. If you look at this picture, you can obviously see that um, there's a mixture of uh, PV plants, photovoltaic plants, um, wind turbines, telecommunication industry, the medical industry, and then conventional um, power stations and so on to your industrial building, for example. This massive network of cables um, is then susceptible and seen basically as lightning antennas for surges and direct strikes. The dry, direct strike, um, radius is three times the height of your building, around your building, but the incoming cable is two kilometers to either side of the cables. And that's why we say that up to two kilometers, um, lightning is still relevant. So what actually happens um, during a direct strike and a um, indirect strike. So I mentioned earlier the direct strike is, is a radius of three times the height of your building, which means you'll actually get directly struck. Secondly, I said the surge damage is up to two kilometers away. That's what we call an induced or the secondary effect. So if we look at the, the direct strike um, option first, you can see that um, why actually uh, electrical equipment damages. So what happens is if we imagine a 100 kA lightning strike to a lightning protection system, air termination rod, which is the highest um, rated lightning current for lightning levels three and four, but we'll get to that. If a 100 kA lightning strike strikes the air termination rod and it's safely conducted down to earth, let's say for example, you have the requirement of a one ohm earth, we use basic Ohm's law, and you can see that um, the voltage is the current multiplied with the earth resistance. That means that the earth bar will go up to 100 kilovolts. Okay, and yes, the earth bar is supposed to be bonded back to the lighting protection system. That's a normative requirement. This rise in the electrical earth 
of 100 kilovolts means that um, there's a potential difference as your system runs on 230 or 400 volts. That potential difference um, from basic uh, physics and theory means that that potential difference is going to be tried to be equaled out. To, in order to do this, there's a flash that occurs from the earthing to the um, 230 or the 400 volt line. That happens inside the electrical equipment. And that's how your equipment actually damages. So in order to prevent this, we install surgeries. We'll get to that. The surgeries, I like to call them fancy bonding machines. All they do is they are passive devices that sit and wait. And when there's a lighting event or potential difference between the two lines, it switches on and bonds all the lines together so that potential difference is not relevant and um, no flashover can occur. So that's for a direct strike. For an indirect strike, we have a lightning strike to the air termination rod. And because lightning is of high frequency behavior, it means that uh, the magnetic field varies and changes. That change, uh, that change in magnetic field then creates an induced current or surge current from the magnetic field as the current passes through the lightning protection system. That induced effect is then casted over all your internal lines and the same happens again. So there's a, a, an induced voltage in the kilovolts range and that me, that's going to be different than the 230 volts of the equipment or even the DC voltage and that causes flash over inside the electrical equipment. Again, we use uh, surge resistors to, to bond all the lines together during an event like this. And I don't know if you noticed, but in the first case, we spoke about a type one surge resistor. So you can see the symbol is a little lightning bolt. It's a little different. And in the second case, um, we use a type two surge resistor where the symbol is also a little different. We'll get into that into more depth next. Okay, so just on the topic of induced surges, this is a study that was done in DEN um, in our labs in Germany. We have one of the largest lightning current generators in the world. So we do get a chance to play around with lightning a bit and actually um, test a lot of different scenarios. In this scenario, we injected a lightning current on the top there to a, um, a, a current carrying conductor. And this induced, um, obviously, then the surge current in the, in the PV panel itself. We changed this distance to see how the lightning current would be proportional to the distance when you move it away. The results were as follow. In the first one I showed you was half a meter. So we injected, uh, injected 50 kA of direct lightning current. And in that direct lightning current, the induced effect was 1 kA of surge current okay, with half a meter distance. If we move that one meter away, it suddenly dropped to half a kA. Of, of induced surge current. And you can see how it quickly attenuates as you start moving conductors away from the PV panels. This is always, uh, obviously not always possible um, as you have a lot of space constraints on PV plants and PV installations. But it's just interesting to see the effect of the, the induced current, to see how large it actually is and if, how proportional it is to the distance itself. What's also important is the um, switching surges from the utility or the grid. Um, this wave shape is also characterized as the same wave shape of an induced surge caused by lightning. Okay, so a type two surge resistor, which I mentioned earlier that protects you on induced surges, will also protect you from switching surges from the utility by the switching of heavy inductive loads. Okay, so on that topic, I spoke about induced and direct strikes. I spoke about type 1s and type 2s. So on this graph, you can see, first of all, at the, the number 1, um, a 10 by 350 wave shape for 100K. 10 by 350 is what we uh, use to define a lightning impulse current or a direct lightning current. Okay, so in order to counter this, as we mentioned in the picture, the need of um, type 1 arises, type 1 SPDs. Secondly, the surge current, um, the secondary effect, is denoted with what we call the 8 by 20 wave shape. I'll explain these two wave shapes in the next slide. Just keep in mind that a type 2 surge rest is used for 8 by 20 and a type 1 surge rest is used for um, 10 by 350. Okay, so what do these wave shapes actually mean? Um, this picture actually shows you. So, um, 
For both wave shapes, 10 by 350 and 8 by 20, they both peak at a maximum of 40 kA. So it's got nothing to do with the peak value in current um, in terms of the wave shape for type 1 and type 2. It's only about the wave shape itself. So in the first case for 10 by 350, this is the red graph. You can see that in 10 microseconds, the graph uh, or the, the wave reaches its peak value of 40 kA and it decays to 50% of its value, which is 20 kA, in 350 microseconds. That's the 10 by 350 wave shape. Secondly, the same for the 8 by 20, just reaches its peak slightly quicker at 8 microseconds and decays to half of its value in uh, 20, 20 microseconds, which is 20 kA. Okay, so when we want to denote the energy, we have to take the area under the graph. And obviously, you can see the area under the red graph is much larger than the area under the green graph. And that's the big difference between type 1 and type 2 SPDs. It's about the energy. And um, you will also see in industry that the type 1 SPDs are obviously much larger in size compared to a type 2 SPD because the equipment inside and the components inside the surgery have to handle a much larger energy in terms of temperature and so on. Okay, so next I have a video. I hope it plays, um, where we show the difference of these two wave shapes. The first one is the surge at, at 40 kA, 8 by 20, and the second one is 10 by 350. You will see that, take or just take note that both of them are at 40 kA peak value. So it's nothing to do with the peak value in terms of difference. It's only about the wave shape. Okay, so let's just see if it plays. Just struggling to get the, the video to play. Okay, sorry. So it's a bit of a technical difficulty um, in terms of the video, but what's nice to see was just that in the first, in the 8 by 20 wave shape, um, the energy is much less, so the cable is just shaking a little bit. And then the second one, it actually breaks the cable into pieces, and both at 40 kA. Um, I will see if I can share these videos um, to the people that ask for the questions and so on. If you want to see the video, you can just send it to you afterwards. Okay, so to define those wave shapes, just to sum everything up um, in one slide, basically, the first um, a source of damage is a direct lightning strike. So we denote this with a 10 by 350 wave shape. And the second one is 8 by 20. Um, that's from uh, induced effects or indirect strikes and also switching surges from the grid. To protect against 10 by 350 um, wave shapes or direct lightning strikes, we make use of type 1 SPDs. And for surges or protection against surges and um, indirect effects or switching surges, we make use of type 2 and type 3 SPDs. But we're going to try and keep this um, to type 1 and 2. Type 3 serves the same function as a, a type 2. They just um, handle much smaller surge currents and um, provide lower voltage clamping levels. Okay, so. Then going into the, the components of protecting a PV system, we'll start with um, the external lighting protection system. The external lighting protection system is made up of the air termination rods that actually intercept the lightning, the down conductor systems, and the earthing system. So the IEC 6305, which is the lighting protection standard, it's been adopted by most countries around the world, um, talks about five pillars of um, of the lighting protection for external light protection systems. First of all, as I mentioned, the air termination system, the pillar on the left, that's the actual lightning rod or finial air termination rod or mast that intercepts the lightning. Um, and this actually then conducts the lightning current safely down to earth via the down conductor system, which is the second pillar, and then disperses the lightning current through the earth um, via the earth termination system. The fourth one is separation distance. So separation distance we'll also discuss, um, but to, to basically sum it up, it's just the actual distance to move lightning conductors away from your electrical system 
to prevent flash over or arcing. And that distance needs to be calculated every time. The fifth pillar is if you cannot maintain, uh, maintain separation distance, you have to bond everything together and lightning current will obviously flow through the entire system. There's a, a very strict uh, stringent requirements for, for lighting potential bonding and the sizes of cable and so on that you have to use. So I mentioned earlier that we also have different lighting protection levels. Okay, so level four is the least amount of protection required and level one, the most amount of protection required. What's important to note is that on both level three and four, the peak value is 100 kA, but you'll see the minimum value where it starts is 10 kA compared to 16 kA. For lighting level one, the, the peak value is 200 kA, but also starts at 3 kA. So what's very important to note is that we don't just look at a maximum increase in peak value, but we also start going close to zero and smaller minimum values. So the band actually widens rather than just shifting towards the maximum. Okay. Um, what's also important to note is that the probability of protection is never 100%. Even in lighting level one, which is the best lighting protection you can deploy, there's a 99% chance that the lightning current will be below 200 kA. So there's still a 1% chance that it might be more than 200 kA. And the same at 3 kA. There's a 99% chance that it will be above 3 kA. There's a 1% chance it will be below 3 kA. If we subtract the 1% on either side, it means the system can only be 98% efficient. So it's never 100%. But the whole concept of lightning protection and risk assessments is based on probability. The lighting protection level is to be determined by means of a risk assessment. Now, there's a whole part two, the IEC 6305 part two of the standard that actually talks about doing risk assessments for PV plants and how, um, well, not for PV plants, but for buildings, we do um, adopt this or, or adapt this for PV plants. Um, and the lighting level is determined via this risk assessment. So if you ever need any assistance with some, something like this, you can always contact um, anyone within the DEN group as well. Um, we do risk assessments and, and so on ourselves if you would like to check something for PV plant. But in general, lighting level three is recommended by the, the lighting protection standards for PV as a starting point. And that's purely because of the minimum value, 10 k value. In South Africa, we've done a lot of studies on uh, PV plants that have been struck by lightning. And we've seen in most cases that the lightning current is actually lower than 16 kA. So the lightning level four uh, protection systems would have missed it on free field PV plants. Okay, so then going into the different components of the external lightning protection system, we'll start with the separation distance. As I mentioned, um, what is understood by separation distance? The separation distance is the distance that has to be calculated every single time between a lightning carrying conductor and uh, parts of the electrical system. This is to prevent flash over from the lightning conductor into the electrical system. This distance, as I said, is not fixed. It's something that has to be calculated every single time. And it depends on factors such as the length of the conductor and the medium through which the lightning current can flash, air or a solid uh, medium like a brick. Okay, so just again, it's the distance between two conductive parts. Okay, this is to ensure that no lightning current will enter your system and that no uncontrolled um, sparking or flash over would occur. This is just an example of uh, PV panels on a rooftop mounted system. So you can see the separation distance from the lightning conductor away from the panels to ensure that it doesn't flash into the lightning system. What's also important to note is that this does not mitigate the risk of the induced surges. The type two surge races for induced surges is still um, required. This just removes the, the need for type one surge races and bigger lightning protection bonding. Also, just keep in mind at the back here, you'll see the angle of the rod. Uh, we'll discuss this when we talk about the air termination system next. Okay, so the air termination system the mast, the finials, and so on. ISE 6305 talks about um, ways to um, define or to size, calculate, or um, dimension a lightning protection system. 
So this is something that, um, that's, that people don't always think about, but if we do deploy lightning protection masts to prevent lightning, how do we actually um, select how tall the masts must be or how far apart they must be? Um, this is done with the design according to IC62305, and this design can be done with three um, different methods. So the first one is the protective angle method, which you saw in that picture with uh, the lightning air termination rod and an angle of protection. The second one is a three-dimensional method called the rolling sphere method, which is a bit more stringent and reduces the probability of strikes, of lightning strikes. Um, it's a little more accurate, I would say. And um, the last one is the mesh method. Now, the mesh method is only applicable to flat um, surfaces, such as um, flat rooftops and so on. It's not relevant if something protrudes out of the, the flat roof. So we won't discuss it in this webinar as um, it, it doesn't form part of the PV scope. But if we look at the, um, the first two methods, the protective angle and the rolling sphere, the rolling sphere, to in, the, in a way to describe it would be, it's a three-dimensional sphere or ball that we do roll um, around the building or the PV plant. And everywhere, everywhere this ball um, touches um, any of, of the equipment or, or parts of the building, lightning is most probably going to strike. So. At the end of the day, when we roll this ball around the, the installation, it can only touch lightning air termination rods, which means the lightning will only strike the air termination rods and no parts of the building. You'll see that based on the lightning protection level, that radius of that sphere changes. Okay, so you'll see it actually gets smaller. Now, if you remember on lightning level one, we were also talking about smaller lightning currents compared to higher lightning currents, which means you'll need more air termination rods for the smaller currents, and that's why we have a smaller sphere. Secondly, the protective angle method, again, is I'll, I'll show it with the, in the next slides with an illustration, but we calculate the angle of protection underneath an air termination rod. Again, this is dependent on the height of the rod and the lightning protection level. The angle changes, the angle is not um, the same for every situation. Now, we do get a lot of misconception in the industry of the 45 degree angle method, and people do talk about it a lot. Um, that's not true for all cases. That angle has to be calculated every single time. So, just an illustration of the different methods. Um, if we start with the protective angle method first, you'll see that the air termination rod, um, based on its height and the lighting protection level, alpha or the angle is calculated, and this angle. I must then cover the, the lighting protection panel. The second is the rolling sphere method. You can see the, the, the um, sag of the sphere, the circumference of the sphere actually hanging between the two air termination rods. Now, as I mentioned, this is a three-dimensional sphere. So um, you can also imagine that the sphere would be rolling out of your screen towards you and further into the screen away from you. It's not just from left to right. Then, with the deployment of all these different air termination rods based on the, the lighting protection design, you'll see that we also do talk about a shadow line. So the shadow line is the big challenge we have in the photovoltaic industry because the shadow on any of your modules means that you'll have a reduction in efficiency and also you might have something like a core shadow that damages your panel. So this is something that also has to be taken into account I'm doing the design of your air termination system. So going into that, then we will um, look at some basic shading theory. Now, not all the standards talk about shading. There's a very nice supplement five in the German version of IEC 62305 that does talk about shading. Now, if you reference out of that part in the German standard, um, you can see it's from German standard, um, 62305 Supplement 5 in Annex A, they do talk about shading. So um, just to, to sum it up, basically, so the effects of reduced insulation, for example, with an air termination rod on a PV module, depends on a lot of different parameters. The electrical reverse voltage current characteristics of partially shaded solar cells or bypass diodes in the modules and the operating point of the PV module strongly influences the operating performance of the power output. So that just sums up what I said, that a shading of air termination rods can affect the module in such a way that you have a loss in efficiency. And then they say the surfaces of PV modules 
should be shaded as little as possible. Now we do know this. How do we actually mitigate this? Standard then further talks about what's known as an umbra and a penumbra shadow. Okay, so an umbra shadow is um, something that should be prevented in all cases. An umbra is the region um, without any insulation from the panel. Okay, so th that's an area that would be completely obscured. The other region is called the penumbra region, and this is a diffused shadow and it's only partially obscured. Okay, so depending on the dimensions of the air termination rod and the, um, the minimum distance to, to, to be kept from the panels, these shadows can actually be calculated. So on the bottom left, you can see um, some basic examples. So the most common one would be the 10 millimeter air termination rod, and that has to be moved at least 1.08 meters away from your panels to prevent an umbra shadow. It will still cause a penumbra shadow in some cases, but that does not mean um, that it will um, impact the efficiency according to the German standard. So what's very important to note, they don't speak about the height of the intimidation rods. They only speak about the diameter and the distance away from the rods. So we do get a lot of inquiries about people complaining of taller masts and wanting sh uh, shorter masts. And from supplement five, this is not 100% relevant. And we only talk about the diameter and the distance in terms of lighting protection and shading. So to sum it up, uh, and this is just a little uh, picture or diagram, an illustration um, of the, the two different shadows. You can see um, on the left, you have the air termination rod, in this case, 10 millimeter air termination rod. And up until 1,08 meters, like I showed in the previous table, we have the umbra shadow and the umbra line. Anything after that is a diffused shadow and should not be a problem to the panels. Okay, so that's air termination rods and separation distance. Moving on to the down conductor system, this would be more relevant, I would say, on rooftop um, scale PV plants um, rather than uh, free field plants, but it's still worth um, looking at. So the down conductor system as the function of conducting the lightning current from the air termination rod down to earth um, via a, a series of conductors. So the standard does say that you need more than one down conductor if it's not an isolated uh, system. And the length of these down conductors must be kept to a minimum. They must be bonded correctly um, with all the, the relevant clamps and components um, throughout the system. So if if we uh, read a little bit further into the standard, it also says that you may use other natural components such as reinforcing, which is a hot topic at the moment for EPCs on rooftop solar, and also um, I-beam structures and gutters and so on, if they satisfy the requirements from 6 to 305 and, and pass tests to be used. These down conductors should also be spaced as equally as possible around the building so that we don't have a very large um, buildup of uh, electric magnetic fields and so on in one section of the building. The spacing of these down conductors changes depending on the lighting protection level. So first at the bottom you can see lighting level four, we have a down conductor system every 20 meters and then if we go up to lighting level one we have a down conductor system every 10 meters. Now the reason why it's exactly double is if you go back to the lighting protection levels for level four, we catered up to 100 kA of lightning current and level one was up to 200 kA of lightning current. So double the amount of lightning current requires double the amount of down conductors to safely distribute the lightning current um, to prevent any flashovers down to earth. Okay, so this is just an example to show you. Um, the down conductors um, should be installed as straight as possible in a vertical manner. Um, it's recommended that um, they are spaced equally apart as per the, the lighting protection level shown. Um, natural down conductors such as reinforcing and items and so on may be used if they pass the test and the requirements of IEC 6305 part three. And all connections shall be made secure by means such as brazing, welding, clamping, crimping, seaming, screwing, or bolting. 
That's also very important. Um, in a lighting protection system, all components used must be tested to 62561, meaning that um, the components and clamps you use should have test certificates so they can handle the mechanical strain of lighting current as well as conduct the lighting current in a fashion that they were designed to. Okay, then moving on to the earth termination system. This is quite different between um, a free field or utility scale PV plant compared to a rooftop PV plant. For a rooftop PV plant, we do look at the earthing requirements more aimed towards a building. So that's standard, pretty standard from the lighting protection um, uh, specification and standards. For free field PV systems, it becomes a little more complex um, as you need to build meshes and the earthing system has to be um, safe against step and touch hazards from 50 hertz um, faults from the transformers and so on, as well as conducting and dispersing lightning current and not um, overstressing any surge protection. These studies can be done. Again, same as with the risk assessment, you're welcome to contact um, ourselves. We do do these studies and we can actually um, assist you with this as well. So the earth termination system, this is also very important. So um, when dealing with the dispersion of lightning current, they say high frequency behavior, as mentioned earlier. So when dealing with the dispersion of lightning current into ground, whilst minimizing any potentially dangerous over voltages, the shape and dimensions of the earth termination system are the important criteria. In general, a low earthing resistance, and then it says if possible, lower than 10 ohm when measured at low frequency is recommended. From the viewpoint of lighting protection, a single integrated structure earth termination system is preferable and suitable for all purposes. So what this means is if we look at something like um, a utility scale free field plant, the earthing system of the plant is to be bonded back to the electrical substation where the tie-in occurs. Also, you cannot move and change different parts of the earthing system. So you, you cannot remove the, the transformer or central inverter skid or something like that um, earthing system um, and not connected to the plant's earthing system. Everything must be interconnected. That's very, very important. And then also, these connections shall be made in accordance with the requirements of um, 6.2 in the IEC 62305 standard. The typical arrangements for uh, the earthing system on a building, um, as I said, is quite straightforward. This uh, what's known as a type A and a type B earthing system. A type A is a, a, a earth rod. Um, it can be a vertical or a horizontal earth rod at each down conductor. So in a horizontal fashion, they must be at least five meters long each, buried at least half a meter depth. And for the vertical rods, um, 2.5 meters each, also half a meter below surface level. The type B is a ring around the building, um, also a meter away, half a meter deep. And then you can also make use of the foundation earth electrode of the building, which would be the reinforcing, if the reinforcing is present. This is just a picture to show um, regarding corrosion. So on um, any of the earthing points, vertical, free field plants, rooftop, utility, doesn't matter. All connections underground that has a conductor coming in from above ground to underground has to be covered up with um, a suitable coating. In this case, it's anti-corrosion or petroleum tape to ensure that corrosion does not occur at the connection point as we aim to have these systems last about 20 years. So if you look at the, the bonding, um, we have three different cases of um, lighting protection um, in terms of bonding specification for PV, and the requirements are quite different. So in the first case, we can say we have a rooftop PV system with no external lighting protection installed, such as masts and so on, um, because the risk assessment said it's not necessary. In this case, the panels and the electrical system can be bonded together with a minimum of six millimeters square copper, and you'll see it says 10 millimeters square aluminum and 16, element, uh, 16 millimeters square for stainless steel um, in order for the surge protection still to function correctly. So six millimeters square is the minimum. In the second case, we have an air termination system, uh, but separation distance is kept. So the risk assessment said we needed um, lighting protection and it was installed. We, we calculated the separation distance and uh, managed to maintain this distance from the 
of lighting protection system. This means that lightning current will go down the down conductor system and will not be able to flash into the PV system. Again, the PV system, the electrical system, will only see the induced or the surge effects. So six millimeter square copper as a minimum is still um, okay to use. In the third case, we have a lighting protection system where we could not maintain separation distance and lightning current will actually enter the, the PV system and the electrical system. In this case, these cables should be able to handle the mechanical stress of the lightning current. And we um, then require from the standard at least 16 millimeters squared of copper. All this is um, required in order for, for surge protection to uh, function properly and also to prevent any unnecessary sparking and flash over to damage um, equipment um, outside that was calculated for the lighting protection system. So then on the topic of bonding and surge protection, moving into surge protection, we uh, first, as I mentioned in the beginning, surge protection is also seen as fancy bonding machines. Um, so when there's a potential difference in the electrical system, they switch on and they, they ensure equipotential conditions. Okay, so um, again, so to, to prevent the occurrence of dangerous sparking within the structure to be protected, we can do physical bonding or make use of um, surge protection. So as I mentioned in the far beginning, for direct lightning currents, we need type one surge resistors. For surge effects and secondary effects, we need to make use of um, type two surge resistors. So type one surge resistors, because they, they um, handle or manage the direct lightning current, they're also referred to as lightning current directors. For, um, so the question is then when to use lightning current directors, the type one surge resistors. First of all, if you have an external lighting protection system, it means that the risk assessment calculated you would have direct lightning strikes to your structure. In this case, then you need to make use of um, type one surge resistors as the lightning current will enter your installation via the electrical earth or the bonding network. Also, if power is supplied via the roof, I mean, there's open roof, oh, open cables on the roof level. Um, also then from um, if, if any of the other conditions such as um, an antenna or anything else galvanically um, being able to couple to your building, you would also then need a type one surge resistor. Okay, so then coordination. Surge resistors all need to speak the same language. Okay, so surge resistors make use of, use of different technologies. Um, and that means that we typically want uh, most of the energy to go through the stronger surge rest in a network and then it should hand over to the smaller surge rests further down. This is known as energy coordination. The only way to achieve this is to use um, uh, surge rests of the same brand or the same manufacturer as they use the same technology. Other than this, you're welcome to try and prove coordination, but to do this, you need to do lab tests and a lot of rigorous um, calculations, taking into account the inductance and the impedance of all the cables throughout your network between surge resistors. Okay, so um, on the, the surge resistor side, so all the equipment inside always has a, a terminal device that we call the S20K, it's one of the most popular ones. It's a blue surge resistor basically. And this is a very small surge resistor that needs to be able to withstand a lot of lightning current passed onto it um, that passes through the rest of the surge protection network. And in this, on this topic as well, um, for interest, uh, just for interest, we've done tests with some of the inverters like the Huawei inverters, um, the 185 KTL inverters specifically, to specifically prove coordination with the internal type two surge resistors and the larger type one surge resistors on the outside, which they did pass. So if, if we try to understand what um, the coordination, what actually happens is if we look at this diagram, so we have a lighting generator on the left, lighting current gets passed into this electrical system where the terminal device has that blue, that small barrister. Um, on the left, we have a type 1 SPD protecting it. In the first case, um, this is just a, a test setup um, with a, a different type 1 barrister. So in this case, um, lightning actually 
uh, pass through the surgery. So there's also a video now that it doesn't um, play with the te technical difficulty. But lightning current passed through the first M uh, type type one barrister, and the residual energy that passed through that went into the terminal device at the inverter actually um, exploded because it overloaded that small device inside the inverter. With um, the second case, we used um, our very unique um, spa gap technology, which we, which we call um, a Radex Flow Spa Gap. And this technology makes sure that um, a very small re residual current gets passed through the, the test setup into the smaller barristyle SPD inside the equipment. And that's what made it possible um, for the, the uh, Huawei 185 um, and some of these spa gap SPDs to actually coordinate, making the test very successful. So in this setup, we make use of spark gap SPD rather than a barrister SPD, um, and then uh, monitor the, the residual current that goes through the SPD into the, the um, terminal device. So just um, the results shown now that the, the, videos, the videos couldn't actually play now. So the results shown of what happened inside the video. In the first case, you can see the blue graph of the total lightning current that was injected. The green graph shows the current that went through that type one barrister device. The red graph shows what passed through the barrister device and still leaked into the terminal device, um, i.e. the inverter, for example. You can see it's still quite a lot and that's why the barrister didn't um, survive the first test. Secondly, um, in the in the use of spark gap technology, you can see that the green and blue graphs almost overlap. So almost all the lightning current went through the spark gap SPD and only a very small portion actually passed through to um, the terminal device and that's why the inverters actually survived. Okay, so then the use of surgery resistors, um, again, just to touch on those three cases quickly. Um, in the first case of rooftop PV, uh, PV systems, we said no external lightning protection is required. That means that there won't be any direct lightning currents from the risk assessment and a six millimeter square minimum bonding cable is sufficient. That still means that you need type two surge resistors. The massive network of DC cable on the roof creates a, an antenna susceptible to a lot of different um, lightning strikes and surge events around the building. So in that case, you would need type two surge resistors when no external lighting protection is required. In the second case, we have an external lighting protection system again, where the air termination system separated from the, the electrical or the PV system. If lighting strikes this air termination rod, lightning current will go down to earth, into the earthing system, if you remember from the first picture. So only type one is necessary there, but the rest of the system that's not bonded to the lighting protection system only requires type two surge protection. And in the last case, um, separation distance was not kept. So if lightning strikes the air termination rods, it will enter the PV system both from the top and from the bottom. So you need type one surge resistors um, throughout your whole system um, to counter the effects of direct lightning current. This is a SNP, just for reference, out of the IEC 61643-32 standard, it also comes from the Senelec standards um, on the minimum ratings of SPDs um, based on their technology for PV systems. Now this standard IEC 61643-32 is the lightning protection standard for PV plants. So that's something that you can take note of, something that's very relevant um, in your industry. Okay, then if we look at um, some more utility scale plants, um, just to close things off, um, the concepts really change, uh, as I said, for, for utility scale plants um, versus uh, rooftop plants. So in this first case, um, we show the, the basic layout of protection. Um, and in this case, it's a string inverter. And you can see on the DC side of the string inverter, type two SPDs is um, sufficient. And on the AC side, type one is required to the tie-in point in the central area with the transformer. Okay, we'll discuss why type two is okay in a, in a few slides. So another concept then, in the first one, just to go back, you'll see that separation distance is kept here. So let's say that um, the, the system will not carry any lightning current on the, the 
the beam structure or the tracker structure. And then the second one, we actually bond the air termination rods to the panels. Both methods are acceptable. In most cases, the bonded system um, is the one that's used. It's much more cost effective, and it also does not obscure or, or obstruct the, the walkways when they need to actually go through and clean the panels um, with use of machinery and so on. Where if you had um, isolated lighting protection masks standing inside these rows, you would have difficulty moving through and cleaning the panels. And in this case, it's a central inverter system with combiner boxes where they require type one in the combiner boxes. I'm going to the inverter building. We'll, we'll touch base on this in a few slides on why um, they require different SPDs. So in the first case, this is with a central inverter. What's very important to note is it's a free field plant with a central inverter system. And you'll see the earth termination system is a mesh of 20 by 20 meters. This is a requirement from the IEC standard. This may, this may, uh, may be increased to 40 meters by 40 meters in some cases. Um, and if any alterations are made, this must be proved with um, simulations. Again, we do do these simulations. So if you ever would like to see examples of this, you're welcome to just get in contact with us. On the bonded lighting protection system, as I mentioned, we connect the lighting protection system to the panels or to the um, tracker structure. Then we make a, a bridging connection across the bearing of the, the system to the pile that's connected to the earthing system. This is for the bonding um, or the bonded method. Now, um, in this, you have different types of foundation that does not matter. So um, you must just ensure that there's an adequate connection when you measure from the tip of the, the air termination rod to the earthing system. All connections from top to bottom are required to be lightning tested at least or be able to withstand um, the lightning current going through the system. You can imagine that you don't have the massive down conductor network like with a rooftop scale PV plant um, using reinforcing and reinforced network. Okay, so if we imagine now um, for the next few uh, slides that a lightning actually strikes the corner of the plant, the reason we talk about a 20 by 20 or 40 by 40 mesh is that lightning actually splits throughout this mesh and this network. This means that by the time it reaches the SPDs at electrical equipment, the, the, um, the lightning current has uh, dispersed or split up so much that the SPD will not be overstressed. In the previous um, a few slides back, I showed the, the ratings of um, SPDs. So for type 1 SPD, they talk about the requirement only being 12.5 kiloamps. If you imagine a 100 kA lightning strike, it actually has to split up so many times by the time, uh, by the time it gets to the electrical system to satisfy the, the 12.5 kA requirement. And that's done by making use of this 20 by 20 or 40 by 40 mesh. Okay, so this is just to show the effect um, as you move away from the point of strike with um, the, the mesh network, you can just see the total current and further away um, versus um, the, the earthing network that's not mesh, meshed as much. So on the concept, on the planning concept of PV plants, again, this directly refers to um, the rolling sphere method you can see. But what's challenging sometimes is that um, we have tracking PV systems. And that means that the angle of protection has to be checked for all different angles of the tracking system moving throughout the plant if it's not a fixed tilt plant. We do this, you can see an example here of one of our designs with a 3D rolling sphere method. It's the side view of a tracker system as it moves and the front view. And you can see that we covered all positions by making use of an air termination rod on both sides of the panel. What we do see is becoming um, quite popular now is that um, EPC and, and designers of the PV plants actually just give us the stow position and they say that if a storm would come in, um, the anemometers and the weather stations would pick up the, the storm front coming in and it would move all the panels into stow position and we only design full coverage according to the stow position. This does save on a lot of material as well. This is just a... Um, typical layout of the central inverter or skid area. So you can see we have freestanding masts around the transformer and inverter stations connected to the earthing system, which is also connected to the PV plant. 
Yeah, this is just an example as well from of the PV plant um, that Den was involved with. You can see the air termination rods, the bonded lighting rods at the back of the panels all the way down. So just I mentioned earlier that um, for central inverters and string inverters, the requirement for SPDs is different um, on the DC side. This is just to explain and to summarize it. So if we look at a, this is now the central inverter system. So if we look at the earthing network of all the panels with an air termination rod, you can see all the cables that feed the string into the combiner box or the junction box um, of each string. If lightning strikes, the current will not split as much across the cables and type 1 SPDs is still necessary um, in the combiner box down to the inverter uh, station where type 1 is also required on the DC and the AC side. In the string inverter sense, the strings are split up into up to 18 to 24 different strings into a string inverter on the DC side compared to the two strings that go in the combiner box from each um, string of PV panels. In this case, then, um, the massive network of a DC cable um, enables a uh, re induced or so, uh, reduced attenuation of the surge across all those cables. So by the time that um, attenuated surge current uh, splits over all the cables and reaches the inverter, the surge current has attenuated so much um, that type 2 SPDs are okay on the DC side of string inverters. But it's still required to have type 1 SPDs installed on the AC side um, and further down to the transformer tie-in point. Okay, so um, just to summarize uh, the that whole setup. So this is something that's very important. Um, for string inverters, type 1 and type 2 SPDs um, are required on the AC side as well as for central inverters. On the DC side for string inverters, type 2 is the minimum requirement, but type 1 plus type 2 is still required for, um, for the central inverters on the, on the DC side. Okay, data lines is also very important and type 1 and 2 SPDs is required in all cases or recommended in all cases for um, the entire PV plant. Okay, so that concludes the webinar then for today. Um, I hope that it was uh, relevant to everyone that joined and it was um, something that you actually can take some knowledge away from. Again, we appreciate uh, everybody that joined. Again, it's a massive crowd, so thank you so much. Um, and then enjoy the rest of your morning, day, evening. Thank you, Ivan. I think that was uh, really informative for all of us. Uh, I think it's important to quickly run through the Q&A sessions as well. After the Q's and A's, we're gonna have a quick survey form after which all participants will be shared the, the presentation slides as well as a certificate of attendance on behalf of Jubaili just to make sure that that you can solidify the information that was shared through us. Let's hand over quickly to Ivan for the Q&A session. We had a lot of questions, so that's good. The more questions is asked, uh, the more information we can gather from it. So I'm going to hand over to Ivan to take care of the Q&A quickly. Thanks, guys. On the questions, um, I see a lot of different questions. So, um, will there be a recording for this webinar? Yes, um, that will be shared with you. Then, can we use the same earthing network for lightning and equipment ground? Yes, so the idea is to, um, to use the same earthing network throughout the entire system. But what's very important also is then, in your electrical system, we do talk about um, short circuits and, and ground faults. So, um, that causes step and touch hazards. That means that when you interconnect your lighting protection earth and your uh, equipment earth, it must um, be sufficient for lighting protection uh, standards and also comply to um, 
uh, step and touch and safety hazards. So yes, um, this has to be done with um, calculations and simulations for, for step and touch voltages. Um, and again, if you, if you want to see some examples of this, you're welcome to just contact us. And then the next one, um, please can you discuss protection of PV panels mounted onto a metal sheet roof of a regular building where the building may have lighting protection already. So I firmly agree. So in some cases, uh, lighting protection is already installed on some of the roofs where PV panels um, or PV modules will be installed for PV system. In this case, um, it can be checked if the lighting protection system still covers the, the PV panels itself. I um, mean, you can actually add to this by just um, uh, amending or modifying the lighting protection system by incorporating some gaps maybe inside the PV system. But it's possible to make use of the lighting protection system that's already installed on some of the metal roofs if it's um, compliant, tested, and you can prove that it actually um, protects the system. Okay. Then next, for a ground mount system, can you discuss the area that could be damaged from a direct strike? if all inverters are protected by type 1 plus 2 SPDs. Okay, so because solar panels are cheap, I have heard the opinion that lightning um, risk or lightning damage to the panels is an acceptable risk as it is cheaper to replace panels than to install air termination masks. So this is something that we do get a lot. We do get this often. Um, we do a lot of simulations around this and test this. But um, if you install type 1 and type 2 SPDs uh, oh, at the electrical equipment, it's obviously going to protect the electrical equipment. But without the use of air termination rods, there's no control on where lightning strikes and how it's conducted to Earth. That means that lightning can not just strike the one panel and damage the one panel. It can actually um, flash to surrounding panels, flash into the electrical system, and so on. And it might actually damage the panels. We mentioned earlier, for example, with a DC combiner box, um, that the SPD is tested or required to only handle 12.5 kA. If you inject 100 kA of lightning current directly onto those panels um, and it flashes from there into the DC system, it will overstress the, the, the DC side on the combiner box at the SPD because it would be way more than 12.5 kA. The idea is that the lightning current is split up through the earthing system by the time it reaches the SPD. Um, and you will not be able to manage or control this. You don't have a dedicated lighting protection system um, conducting um, into ground. But we do know that a lot of people uses the or use the, the damage as a, of two panels as a residual loss, and they accept this this loss in most cases. Okay. For ground mounted PV system where the mounting posts are piled. Um, into the ground, can you comment on whether the amount of metal that has been piled into the ground is sufficient for earthing? Normally, the posts are piled over one meter into the ground, so um, it seems that it's a good earth. Okay, so the piles, um, they obviously do help um, in terms of earthing. They are seen as a lot of earth rods, but the idea behind the earthing system is that um, we need to split up the lighting current by the time it reaches the electrical system. This has to be done by a meshed network. So your piles still need to be connected to some form of earthing um, to ensure that it splits through the, the piles, the overhead beams or the, the tracker arms and so on. Um, and not just the pile will, would be sufficient to split up the earthing current um, enough. Okay, so what are the recommended bending, bending radius of the lightning conductors? So the, that's a very good question. So the air termination rod itself, um, we bend those um, depending on the angle that we need protection of your, um, your PV system. So that can be the angle of the tracking system or the fixed tilt system. That's very different. But there's also a, a minimum bending radius that you may bend any lightning conductor. If you bend a lightning conductor too much and it forms a sharp corner, lightning will actually exit the conductor at that corner. That bending radius has to be calculated um, based on the, the diameter of the conductor. But again, if you would like to, to know more about this, you can just uh, pop us an email and I'll send you some of those calculations in white papers as well. Where does the more than 10 meter critical length come from? 
why not eight or 15 meters? So this is a, a question from a, a good colleague of ours as well. So um, the 10 meter critical length uh, comes from uh, the voltage drop across a conductor. So in the older days, they actually um, used a long 15 meter length of cable between two SPDs that they coiled up and installed inside the board. And this is to limit the amount of energy um, and control the spark over voltages and the voltage at each SPD. The 10 meter length um, is, is calculated from the standard in most cases on um, nominal values and the withstand voltages of, of equipment and tested equipment. So um, again, it's it's a it's a guideline if you if you do the calculation based um, on different sizes of cable and so on, you can prove a different length um, on the calculations and simulations, and you can also do so. Okay, what is the what is your recommendation? Um, for AC and DC system, earthing and equipotential bonding. So um, the recommendation again for the earthing system is the 20 by 20 or the 40 by 40 mesh. We do find ways around it in terms of simulations, but you have to prove that it will still be sufficient. Um, the equipotential bonding stays with the six millimeter and the 16 millimeter rule um, for direct and indirect lightning currents. Um, but those are all um, highlighted specifically in the lightning protection standard. If you need us to look at that for you, please just send us an email through and we can assist you with that as well. Uh, what is the relationship between type 1 and 2 and class 1 to 4? So type 1 and 2 is the types of SPDs um, based on the direct lightning current, 10 by 350 or 8 by 20 surges. Um, class 1 to 4 is the actual um, lightning protection level, if I understand your question correctly. So that's all direct lightning current um, from 16 kA up to um, 100 kA and 3 kA up to 200 kA. That's actually the lightning protection levels. Um, but in some different standards, they talk about class, types, um, and levels. So they do, that's very interchangeable um, across different standards around the world. Okay, so next question. Just going to move on to this one. So ideally the lower ground resistance the better what is the worst ground resistance we can work with so that's also a very good question um they do speak about a recommended below 10 ohm um, but they in the 6 to 305 um, standard they give the minimum length of earthing to be installed based on the earth resistivity of the soil so in 6 to 305 you can actually calculate it but there's no uh, worst ground resistance that, that you can work with that has to be calculated either than or, or minimum length and if you achieve minimum length um, that should be okay. okay so i think we're going to do one more question and then the questions that we did not get through to um, will be emailed to me and i will respond to the, all of them in due time we do have quite a lot of um, feedback a lot of questions so just give us some time but we will get back to to each and every question so the last question, um, which distance can one air terminal offer protection when placed on a rooftop of around 30 meter? This is, um, this is a very vague question. So um, this has to be calculated. Um, again, if you go back to the, in the slides where we spoke about the rolling sphere method and the angle method, it's dependent on a lot of different things like the height and um, other uh, buildings or structures in the vicinity to see if it covers or not. To know if it really covers, you have to do the distance uh, or the, or the um, lighting protection design and actually calculate it based on one of those three methods that I mentioned. Um, but you're welcome to send it if you would like us to have a look at that as well. Okay, so then um, the rest of the questions, like I said, we'll get back to. Um, from my side, again, thank you for everybody joining and then enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>